Hi guys, Claudia Bullen here, and today we're going to be talking about May the 3rd, 1536. So, to recap, where we left off yesterday, we had four very important figures in the tower. We had the Queen Anne Boleyn, we had her brother George Boleyn, we've got nobleman and groom of the stall, Sir Henry Norris, and we've got Flemish musician Mark Smeaton. Sadly, none of these people are going to leave the tower again. All four of them are going to be executed. Now, on the 3rd of May, we don't have an awful lot of information about George, which is understandable, because George would have been considered a lesser prisoner. Anne is the one that's being watched and the one that's being reported on, but we do have two very important events happening on this day in 1536. So the first one I want to talk to you about is the Thomas Cranmer letter. So what we know is that on this day, Thomas Cranmer, who is the Archbishop of Canterbury, writes Henry VIII a letter about his surprise at these accusations. He's just found out what's going on. Now this is a horrible situation for him and I'm gonna explain a little bit about who he is and why this is such a traumatic event. So Thomas Cranmer has been working his way up in the church for most of his life. He started out as quite a strict Catholic, but over the years, he traveled more widely. He was hired to help Henry VIII try and get his annulment from Catherine. And during that, he traveled across Europe and he saw the effects of reform and Lutheranism. And he gradually began to convert his views started to become more reformist closer to Anne and George's. When I talk about Lutheranism it really just means reformers because it's named after Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a German reformer of the time which is why it's called Lutheranism sometimes but when I say Lutheranism I just mean reformer. So just to recap on the political and religious landscape of the time you've got the traditional Roman Catholics who want things as they are, they support tradition, they support the idea that in mass the wine and the wafer is literally the body and the blood of Christ, whereas the reformers think that the church needs to be modernised, they're less interested in superstition, and they think that the Bible should be available in English so that common people can read the Bible, so the common people can't be manipulated by men higher up in the church who might be using the power for their own ends. Just so you get an idea of how huge this is, you could be burned at the stake for being a heretic in this time, and all it takes to get you branded a heretic in this time could be you saying that you don't believe that in mass the wafer and the wine that you're drinking is the literal blood and body of Christ. Just saying that can get you labelled a heretic and you can be burned, it's that serious. So Thomas Cranmer is respected and he's kind of important but he's not expected to go on to anything huge in his career. However, it just so happens that the former Archbishop of Canterbury dies and they need to find a successor. Now this is the time when Anne Boleyn is in her relationship with Henry. The Boleyns have got a significant amount of power at court so it's very important to them that the next person who gets installed as the Archbishop of Canterbury is is going to be someone that is kind to reformers because at this point reformers are being burnt at the stake it's so important to them that they can get someone who will go easy on the reformers they are essentially trying to save lives by doing this so it's Anne and her family that suggest Thomas Cranmer for this role because they know that he has more reformist leanings and that he'll be able to save more people. So Anne is therefore Thomas Cranmer's patron and without her he wouldn't have got into the position of the Archbishop of Canterbury which he takes up in 1533 which is the same year that Anne becomes Queen. So Thomas Cranmer owes a lot to Anne and he is a friend of the Boleyn family. They're all reformers so they have similar political beliefs. Thomas Cranmer is in a difficult situation though, he has to be ever so careful. He can't push too hard for reform because it will put him in danger. So we've got one situation in history where there's a man called John Frith who is a reformer, a heretic they call him, and they're going to burn him at the stake. Archbishop Cranmer goes to him and basically begs for him to deny his beliefs because it will save his life. So it doesn't really matter what he believes inside, if he will just verbalise, if he will just lie and say that he doesn't believe it anymore, Cranmer can save him and wants to save him, but unfortunately this particular person won't go back on their words and very sadly they are burned at the stake. So that's how dangerous this is. If they're going to try and change society and the politics of the country, they have to do this ever so carefully. Now bear in mind that Cranmer is a friend of Anne and her family. He thinks very well of them, they've helped him get into his position. He knows that she's a reformer and he knows the stick that she's getting in the country and at court because of this. So he is her supporter and he may even have been her friend. Now a sign of just how sinister this plot against Anne is, is that Archbishop Cranmer has been in constant correspondence with Thomas Cromwell. Thomas Cromwell, as I spoke about before, is the King's chief minister, and he is one of the two men, so it's Cromwell and Chapuis, who are orchestrating the plot against Anne, but it is mostly Cromwell at this point. Thomas Cranmer is in correspondence with Cromwell quite a lot, to do with minor issues in England, they're both in high up roles, so they would be in communication. Think about it sort of like the government today. 
Yet Thomas Cromwell never once lets slip anything about this plot against Anne, so this is being kept from the Archbishop of Canterbury. Clearly it's being kept from him because he is a supporter of Anne, potentially a friend of Anne, and he will also be able to stop it in its tracks and be able to say before it goes too far, this is ludicrous, this is ridiculous. So it's important to Cromwell and it's important to the king that they keep this as private as possible, as secret as possible. They did not want anyone to be able to step in, to stand up for Anne, to point out that it's ridiculous and unfair. They needed it to get to a certain point before anyone else knew about it. So on the 2nd of May, that's yesterday for us, Archbishop Cranmer is invited to go and see Thomas Cromwell urgently. Now he's probably not going to think that much of this because, as I said before, he does correspond with Cromwell about issues to do with England. Now poor Cranmer is in for the shock of his life when he gets to Cromwell's and finds out about the plot and the accusations against Anne. Cranmer is an intelligent man, he is aware that these accusations are false, but also he can see the danger that Anne is in because this plot has got to a significant point. Now we don't know what was said in that meeting, but we do know that on the 3rd of May, the day after, Cranmer writes a letter to Henry VIII, and it's probably one of the most difficult letters he ever had to write. Now he is in a terrible, precarious position. To us looking back, you might wonder why he wouldn't just say, this is nonsense, this is ridiculous, this surely can't stand, surely she'll be proved innocent at trial. But the Tudor age was very different, and also the way we think about Henry VIII now is not how they would have thought about Henry VIII then. So when we think about Henry, we tend to think of the tyrant king that he becomes later. At this point in history, Henry is still transforming into that tyrant king. So yes, those cruel aspects of his personality are there, but he's not at that point a full-blown tyrant. He is on his way there. So you can imagine how frightening that is for the people around him, starting to realise that this goodly prince, this wonderful Christian prince that they all supported and thought was the saviour of their country, is actually starting to turn into a dangerous tyrant and they're all in danger. Cranmer has a terrible choice to make here because Anne is his friend, she's his patron. Her family got him into his position. They're reformers. They believe in reforming the country and making it fairer in their eyes. But also, as I said, in the political and religious climate, it's a time when heretics are still being burned. So it is vitally important that Thomas Cranmer maintains his position so that he can protect as many reformers as possible. So poor Cranmer is going to be weighing this up in his mind. The life of the innocent woman who got him into his job, or the lives of the reformers that he can save from burning and protect. If Cranmer openly stands against the king now, he will lose his position and he will put those reformers at risk. So all that work that Anne and George have done in convincing the king towards reform and making these changes, that could be reversed overnight. So in Cranmer's letter, he can't openly oppose the king. He can't can't tell the king that he believes he's wrong or cruel or that he knows for certain that Anne is innocent. All he can do is try and appeal to the king's better nature because at that time they still did believe that Henry had that better nature and hope that this letter will make Henry think and perhaps save Anne's life. So I'm going to read you some extracts from Cranmer's letter now. So here is what he says to Henry about how he's just found out about these accusations and about Anne. I am in such a perplexity that my mind is clearly amazed for I never had better opinion in woman than I had in her, which maketh me to think that she should not be culpable. So basically what he's saying, I am in such a perplexity that my mind is clearly amazed. So he's shocked, he couldn't have imagined this happening. He then says, I never had better opinion in woman than I had of her. So this is him openly saying that he trusts in her character and he thinks that she's a good and honest person. He has to be so careful that he says here, which maketh me to think that she should not be culpable. Now recognize that he can't say this is nonsense, she has to be innocent. Instead he has to pose it like a question, like he's pondering it, like a thought. You know, I always knew her to be such a good person, so this is really perplexing to me, and I don't understand how she could have done it. But he has to be so careful and diplomatic because this is his position on the line, and this is the lives of the reformers that he can save. So then he goes on to say, and again, I think your highness would not have gone so far, except she had surely been culpable. So this is clever, this is him saying to the king, but I know that you wouldn't have gone so far and done such terrible a thing if you weren't sure she was guilty. So that still gives Henry the leeway to not be the villain. He can say that he was manipulated by his counsellors and he's a good man, he truly thought it and now he no longer thinks it. So Cranmer is trying to play on Henry's conscience here. He says, now I think that your grace best knoweth that next unto your grace I was most bound unto her of all creatures living. And if she be found culpable, considering your grace's goodness towards her, 
and what condition your grace of your mere goodness took her and set the crown upon her head, I repute him not your grace's faithful servant and subject, nor true unto the realm, that he would not desire the offence without mercy to be punished to the example of all other. So what he's saying here is that aside from you, Henry, she was the person that I trusted most and loved the most. He also praises the king here because as we can see from later tyrant Henry, the tyrant that he's becoming, he's very vain. He needs to be praised. So Cranmer is praising him for being so good to Anne and raising her to this high position. This is clever because it's playing on Henry's mercy. Henry likes to see himself as merciful and loved. He cares deeply about his reputation with the people. So this is Cranmer trying to play on that mercy and make him play that merciful prince. Cranmer also says, and as I loved her not a little for the love which I judged her to bear towards God and his gospel. So here he's saying that she's a good religious woman and that he always judged her to be very faithful to God and the gospel. And then he then adds, so if she be proved culpable, there is not one that loveth God and his gospel that ever will favour her, that must hate her above all other, and the more they favour the gospel, the more they will hate her. It's very important here that he says, if she be proved culpable. So he's saying, if she has portrayed you in this way, then of course everyone who loves God and loves the king will hate her, but if she is proved culpable. And he again is subtly expressing his doubts that she could be proved culpable. So a lot of people have interpreted this letter from Cranmer as cowardice and that he should have just openly stood up for Anne, but I think those people with the best of intentions because they do support Anne much like I do, I think that they're not taking into account his situation. And I do actually think from what we know of Anne and what we know of George and their thoughts about reform and how important that was, I think they would have considered it very important that the Archbishop of Canterbury was somebody that favoured reform and that could protect other reformers. And again, when we look back, this is tragic because we know the Henry of later years. We know him when he was a complete tyrant, when people were afraid to speak against him, when the wrong word could get you beaten. This is not the Henry they know. They still think that this is essentially a good man with bad counsellors. They don't yet realise the full extent of his cruelty and I think for some of them it's a shock because it's starting to dawn on them. Even Eustace Chapuis, who I talked about before, who was an ally of Cromwell despite their different religious views, was quite shocked for example when they took George in and by the incest allegations. Even he thought that was bizarre and especially cruel and when he was first taken in he couldn't understand why they got him, what was the point? This is Henry VIII showing his spite because we know from later years that he is a spite man. If he feels wounded by you in any way, he will lash out. And it's worth noting here that Thomas Cromwell, who is his advisor, who is planning all this against Anne, not too long in the future will suffer at the hands of Henry the Tyrant King and Cromwell will be put to horrible execution. Cromwell is going to be destroyed by the monster that he helped to create. So now we're going to revisit Anne again in her time at the Tower. So bear in mind Anne is being spied on by the women who are attending her. Master Kingston, Constable of the Tower, is in correspondence with Cromwell and he is taking information from those women, one of whom is his wife, and sending it to Cromwell. Anne is in a state of trauma, of shock, she's experiencing a mental breakdown, or the symptoms of a mental breakdown. She is not mentally well right now, she is terrified for her life. A small conversation that we know was had between Master Kingston and Anne is Anne saying to Master Kingston, Master Kingston, shall I die without justice? And trying to reassure her, Master Kingston told her that even the poorest subject of the king will have justice. And upon hearing that, Anne just started laughing because she knew it wasn't true. She knew that there was no justice under the king. Now, Anne has been told at this point that Sir Henry Norris, Mark Smeaton and Sir Francis Weston are in the tower with her and that they are accused of adultery. Anne absolutely cannot believe it because she's innocent of this. So she tells Kingston, my God, bear witness there is no truth in these charges. I am as clear from the company of man as from sin. Now of those three men, I've already spoken to you about Mark Smeaton, who is the lower class musician, Henry Norris, who is groom of the stool and a friend of Anne, George and the King. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Francis Weston now. So unfortunately, Francis Weston too is going going to be executed for adultery with the Queen. But Anne has been tricked here. Francis Weston has not yet been arrested and he is not in the tower. She has simply been told this to try and make her confess. Now in a horrible twist of fate, something Anne says is going to implicate Francis Weston and it's going to lead to his arrest and it's going to lead to his execution. So Anne in her state of mental breakdown is known to be muttering to herself. She's going through everything that's happened. She's trying to work out why on earth she's here, why the king thinks she's committed adultery, why with these men has she been betrayed by one of these men? Has one of them been paid to lie about her? So she's trying to puzzle this out and she does not realise that she is being spied on by the women that are attending her. Now when it comes to Henry Norris, she 
thinks she can remember a conversation that they had which might have made people think that they were having an affair or that could have been used against her. So bear in mind that Anne and George have a particular friendship group at court, they're quite young, they enjoy having a laugh, they have quite a lot of banter. So Henry Norris is lingering around court quite a lot and he's taking a while to get married, he's not yet married. So Norris is due to be marrying Lady Shelton, Lady Shelton is Anne's cousin and a friend of Anne's, so she's trying to move this on a bit, you know, why have you not married her yet? Come on Henry. Norris's response is that he was waiting a while. This did not please Anne, and Anne remarked to him, you look for dead men's shoes, for if what came to the king but good, you would look to have me. Now it's said that at the time people gasped at this because what Anne is actually saying is that you're not getting married because you actually like me, don't you? Now the way this is reported is quite interesting because it's reported as a great quarrel, apparently everyone was really shocked. Henry Norris immediately said if he should have any such thought, he would his head were off. So if he was thinking of supplanting the king, then he deserved to have his head cut off. So for a long time this has been reported as a great quarrel between Anne and Henry Norris, as if they'd had a real argument over it. But I think looking back, a lot of historians reading this don't quite go with that interpretation because to start with, you would not be talking about the death of the king because that was treason. You would not be doing that in public. There is no way. It's far too dangerous for Anne to imply that. Second, we have to think about their relationship and their friendship. And then thirdly, after this has happened, they just go to the May Day joust the next day. Henry Norris is riding for the king in the joust. It just doesn't really make much sense. So what I think, and what quite a lot of other historians think, is that this was actually a bit of banter that went too far. This was Anne saying, look, come on, my friend, like, when are you going to get married? And he was like, oh, not yet, not yet. And she was like, oh, I see. Like, clearly, clearly you're just, you're waiting for me, aren't you, the superior bride? Because Anne was known to sometimes be a bit edgy with her humour and maybe go a little bit too far. But I and a lot of other historians think that this is very unlikely that this was actually a serious conversation and a serious quarrel. Again, consider how shocked Henry Norris was at the accusations. Consider how shocked Anne was. I mean, if this had happened you might be anticipating something. We have to remember that after Anne was executed, so many of the documents, the portraits of her, information about her, the good stuff was either destroyed by her enemies to try and ruin her reputation and make sure people wouldn't realise that she was so wronged. And so a lot of the stuff that exists comes from her enemies and is part of the propaganda against her. So sometimes we have to think about the context, we have to think about the world they lived in. Would people really be speaking openly about the death of the king? No, of course she wouldn't, unless it was a joke. Because if she had really done that, that would be a huge, huge scandal. Now, poor Frances Weston is about to get implicated in this too, and it's during Anne's ramblings when she's trying to work out why on earth she's there, why the king has arrested these specific men, her friends. She mentions something that Frances Weston says, and she wonders if this was maybe why he was arrested, even though, of course, he wasn't arrested yet, and this was a trick. Apparently, she spoke to her ladies-in-waiting in the tower, and said how she had reprimanded Frances Weston for loving her relative, Mistress Shelton, and not his wife. So she thinks it's a bit out of line that he's got a wife at home and he's flirting in the court. So Frances says rather cheekily that he loves one in the house better than them both, better than Mistress Shelton and his wife. And it's courtly love, it's him paying a compliment to the Queen, it's saying, ah, oh, but you see, I love you above them all. The Queen is then said to have defied him, so it sounds like Anne was annoyed that Francis had a wife at home, he's flirting around the court and that he thinks this funny and that she kind of told him off. And the sad thing is, this is how courtiers would have spoken. There was this idea of courtly love, it's very Arthurian. The Tudor court was very inspired by the court of King Arthur, so it was quite usual for the men to talk in terms of courtly love, where they would declare their undying love for their beautiful queen and they'd die at her feet. And everyone knew it wasn't serious, that was just the way it always run, so it was a especially cruel of Henry to suddenly take this seriously and use it against people. So this small comment by Francis Weston about courtly love, this man who is a friend of Anne and George and one of their circle, ends up getting him arrested unfortunately. Thanks for watching everyone, as always if you have any further questions, you want any sources, you want book recommendations, put that in the comments section. I'm enjoying reading your comments and I'm glad that um, so many people are enjoying these. I'll see you soon for the next instalment, love you loads, bye! George, George
what goes my 